Testing. Everybody have a good conference so far? Woo! Give it up to the B-Sides Philly crew. I think they've done an excellent job, and I've learned a lot. Uh, while, I'm, while I was here, um, I learned about the APRS network. I learned about how to hack myself, how to ask for permission to hack. I've learned about social engineering. I learned about PowerShell and hacking Outlook. I've learned a lot more than I'm probably going to give in this presentation, but um, thanks for coming to see me. So today I'm going to talk about size doesn't matter, metrics and other four-letter security words. And it's really just about a metrics program. Before we get started, I want to make sure the disclaimer comes out here. Everyone can hold hands or bow their head and say the prayer of the information security professional. The information in this presentation is solely the opinion analysis. The presenter, no employer past or present, endorses any of the information or opinions contained within. And I give credit um, to my, my buddy there, Ian, for making it a prayer. So you should always say that before you present any information. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, 17 years in information technology. Uh, with numerous roles, so I've done application development. Any mobile application developers? Keep your hand up if you've done it on Palm Pilots. Okay, yeah, before you had an app store and you can monetize everything, that's when I was doing mobile application development. Um, I've done enterprise architecture and I've also uh, in information security. Um, I'm a native son of Philadelphia, an alum here at Drexel University, Temple University, uh, hold a CISSP, and I'm a director in Philadelphia today. Um, just so you know a little bit about me, my interests are Beer, poetry, technology, and football. So if you do want to social engineer me, buy me a beer, tell me a poem about a robotic football team that, uh, that is going to reduce the number of head injuries in, uh, in human football. So that's really up to you guys. So a little bit about, a little bit of my uh, agenda today. It's really about you are here. Really identifying where you are in this space in terms of where you are in your information security metric program and, um, uh, to start with. And then once you identify that, so where does that actually leave you? What are you going to do about it? going to talk to you a little bit about size and why it does not matter. And then once you identify it doesn't matter, what the important things are actually go, go after, so where to actually start. And then I'm going to bring it all together so you guys can actually see an implementation in progress. So you are here. I remember going to the King of Prussia Mall. If you guys, and nobody from Philadelphia, King of Prussia Mall is pretty big. Uh, but I remember going there, got the bus, traveled all the way into um, uh, to the mall, and I walked in and it was so expansive. I was on the third floor somewhere, and I, I didn't know where I was, so I, I meandered around until I finally got to one of those giant directories with a big board, and it had the arrow, and the little dot said, you are here. Where, where was that? I mean, I was just, you know, I'm on the third floor, I'm suspended in uh, the universe, I have an X, Y, and Z coordinate, and yet I didn't know where I was. And I think sometimes when you run an information security program, it feels like that. You have this really, you know, I have all these blinky box tools, but you really can't identify or tell the story. So. Everybody comes up to you and says, are we secure? You know, do, you, do we have a, an are we protected against ransomware? Yeah. Uh, do you have enough, you know, are you doing a good job? Yeah, I am. What did you do with the money, Jim? What did you do with the money? Because that's what they're really asking at the end of the day. What have you done with all the money? You bought every blinky box. You, you have all the, the, the great toys. You have MSPs. You have... Sock, you have all these, these cool things, but they want to know what you did with the money. And how I translate that is really, do you have an effective information security program? And how are you telling that story? So for purposes of this presentation, I'm going to have a, I have a company called Snowco. We are the leading distributor of Englobe Christmas decorations in the United States starting since 2006. So everything I talk about is going to be through the lens of the Snowco company. We're actually the leader in the Southeast. I don't know why that is, but it's kind of strange. I guess it's they don't get enough snow. Um, so when I got to this job in uh, Snowco, they handed me the endpoint protection program. They said, hey, Jim, this is, here you go. You can do the endpoint protection for the organization. They said, look, 100% covered. You have 100% of these endpoints covered. This is a great job. They just handed me the keys to the caddy, and daddy's going to go through a, go for a drive. He doesn't even, you know, just make sure you don't run anybody over or hit any, um, any guardrails, and you'll be OK. So I started asking some of the engineers questions. I said, hey, where'd you get that number from? And I said, uh, I don't know. Give me, give me a second. They start typing away to, to talk about this number. And they come back the next day. And they said, well, the desktop engineering team gave it to us. I said, how'd they get it? Come back the next day. Oh, um, it's based on the software distributions uh, package. And it's the number of installs. Well, is it accurate? I don't know. 
So I started peeling layer by layer back, and 100% quickly became 50%. Does this sound familiar to anybody? And so what's, what was the problem here? Well, installs, right? When you install something, you still need to maintain it. So just because you installed something doesn't mean it's still there. There's people that uninstall it, people with elevated pr privileges that uninstall it. There were services that just weren't running. I think there was a couple instances where it just stopped starting altogether and no one, no one actually investigated. But I don't really fault them because, I mean, what ends up happening is you're doing your day job and you're on the hamster wheel of tasks coming at you, new projects, new requests, all day long, and you don't have enough time to do it. So a lot of people will go out and they'll buy a security event, an incident management program, you'll ingest every log in your organization, you'll do everything you need to do, but that's you know, through one single pane of glass and it's information overload. You don't need to answer every question, you just need to answer the important ones. Is my security program effective? And so sometimes it's like finding that proverbial um, needle in a needle stack. Watch your hands. So I got it, I got it, I got the answer to the question, Jim. The answer is big data. That's what we need is big data. If the answer to your question is big data, then the question is stupid. I mean that facetiously, but you're answering the question, is my information security program effective? Okay, so in order for you to prove that it's effective, you need a team of data scientists, a team of analysts, uh, maybe some engineers, and you, can't even, you won't be able to answer the question, is my security program effective? And no offense to data scientists, they're just expensive. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about size. How big is your program? How big is your program? You know, I don't know. But, yeah, are anybody fans of Ghostbusters? Not the new one? Oh. Well, in Ghostbusters, they have that scene with Ray and Egon where he says, hey, we got a big problem. And Ray goes, how big, Egon? And Egon goes, paraphrasing. Egon says, if you see this Twinkie here, it has all the psycho, uh, if it had all the psychokinetic energy in, uh, in the New York area, it would be 35 feet long and 600 pounds. He added some context to it, right? So how big was it? You kind of get an idea of how big a 35 foot, 65 foot uh, Twinkie is. But how big is a Twinkie compared to a thumbtack? Anybody not have a Twinkie? Yeah, about this big. But thumbtacks? About the size of your thumb, right? They call them thumbtacks. But how do I know? Well, I could use a ruler. I could measure it. But still, the Twinkie looks a little bit longer, if you ask me. What about a 747? Everyone knows a 747 is bigger than a Twinkie. At least I hope so. But what if it's a model? I don't know. Let's measure it. So I'm here to talk about size doesn't matter. What's going to matter to your information security metro program is value, is providing context. How big is it? And now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to actually do that. So you are here. You're owning that space. You know where you're at. Now you have to actually put a plan together. And it's pretty simple. I offer two, two phases this. One, put a plan together. Two, execute on that plan. Rinse, repeat, always repeat. So the first step here around uh, the plan is just don't re reinvent the wheel. This is really about inventory. I think every, every talk about inform uh, information security management is really just about getting that initial inventory to understand what you're actually protecting to begin with. So I'll talk a little bit about what that means. I'll also talk about once you have an inventory, how do you prioritize it? If you have a million questions to answer or different questions your board wants you to answer, how do you actually go in a, in a prioritized manner so you could, um, you could do the right thing and, and be more secure faster, more effective faster? So um, before I get to this slide, there, there's one convention I forgot to call out. The four-letter security words are actually any reference to any framework or outside resource. I think a lot of times people get overwhelmed with them because they're just, it's great. Yeah, I have a framework, now what do I do? So I, I make some call-outs to them, but I don't specifically get into them because I think it's simpler than sometimes just using a framework. I think you can do it a lot quicker without a framework, but I do make reference to them here. So um, don't reinvent the wheel. We're talking about inventory. Inventory your applications. What do they do? Inventory the infrastructure they sit on. Are they on-prem, in the cloud? Are they in the DMZ? Are they in another country? Maybe there's regulations in another country you have to worry about, right? Having that inventory becomes a blueprint for your roadmap. And then you have these users, these people that are using the applications. What do they do with it? Who owns the information? 
right? Getting that, that, getting that, uh, that information really be becomes the, the foundation for your blueprint. And you should spend a lot of time on this. Four letter security word uh, call out here. The CSC 20, used formerly the SANS 20, the top uh, 10, uh, 20 critical controls. Number one is inventory your authorized and authorized systems. Cybersecurity framework, identify asset management. Phase number one, simple stuff. It's already out there. You can use these tool sets. Because, but now you are here. You didn't rent the, reinvent the wheel. You are here. You have an inventory. Now what do you do? Prioritize. And you can prioritize any method you use. I think this is pretty effective, but data classification. How sensitive is the information to your organization? Is it restricted? Intellectual property? EPHI? PII? And what is it really? Location. Where, where is the information? I don't know. In the cloud? But you want to, you want to identify where these things are because these are going to be inputs to how you go after the assets that you want to protect. And then critical processes. So, you know, how important is this information in your business? If it went away, could you still operate? And if you're in a, a business continuity role or disaster recovery role, you could just put your recovery point objective in here and your recovery time objective and, you know, you already have that information. And if you don't, this is a good place to get started. If you start answering yourself these questions and say, Jim, I, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, you could start there by identifying where the gaps are in your program. And a lot of the four letter security word call out here, CSF covers it under respond and recover and the CSC 20 covers it under data protection. So some of these things are already there, but it, you don't have to do this. I'm going to show you a little bit about how, how I've done it in the past, how I do it today. I don't, I don't go overboard with it. So application inventory, here it is, an Excel spreadsheet. I took my application name, Salesforce, I have an ERP, undisclosed name, SharePoint, and some, some weird FedEx postal application that's sitting in the corner of the data center and no one knows what's happening. But I have them all on here and I've classified them. I put information labels against them. I've talked about where that information actually exists. I, I talk about what happens when the information goes away, how important that is to my organization. And I've assigned a priority label. Seems simple. It should be. I mean, size doesn't matter. It's an Excel spreadsheet with some information on it. So for the sake of argument here, I'm going to talk through my company that uh, I used to work for, Snowco, and these are the lab labels we've actually ended up using. So the labels, uh, attributes I picked for, for ranking were classification, department, and job level. So under classification, I have a one to four rating, whether something's really inside the organization versus whether it's outside or restricted information. From a department perspective, we've ranked at certain functions maybe a higher risk than others. And job level, and this is interesting because I put the VPs at the top, but they usually are. They have the, they set the policies, but a lot of times in real organizations, they also are the most access to information and they're the most permissive in terms of what they have access to, um, which is scary sometimes. But you can use whatever labels you guys want for this. You want wider numbers, bigger numbers. I'm just using qu this qualitative analysis. This isn't you know, quantitative in nature. There's no data to support this. This is how you rank your information, how you uh, rank your risk in your organization. So I'll show you how it walks, walks through, pretty simple. So these are uh, fictitious use cases here uh, for Snowco, and I talked about what my rankings were. You know, they become numbers pretty quickly, which um, they all flip over to the one, four, uh, two, three ranking, and then I multiply them together to get a, an aggregated risk score of what I, what I want to use for my prioritization. Now you guys can use whatever you need, but here it's telling me that uh, Jane, was in research director, has access to confidential information, probably intellectual property. And maybe sure at Apple working on Project Titan, open secret, right? But um, this is the priority. This is the use case I want to go after. Now, if you, if you have a lot of assets to maintain, you know, prioritization makes sense. But if you have 50 assets, 100 assets, maybe prioritization doesn't make sense. But what if those 100 assets, in order to put protection on them, takes a lot longer, right? You have 100 systems, but they, they can't have zero, down, you know, zero downtime. So now, Prioritization still makes sense to say, I'm going to take these down first to put it on there, or, or whatever protection scheme you're going to put on there. Does this make sense so far? It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Size shouldn't matter. It should be just common sense. So now we're going to talk about executing. And I put it through these lenses here. The first one is efficiency. It's, it's really how well does it perform, uh, how well do I scale? I bought my blinky box, I bought my agent, I did whatever, and now I want to deploy that in my environment. Have you deployed it? Effectiveness. How well does that control perform? You put it in there, what's it doing? Next two pieces are, are more of like a contextual, more of like painting the outlines of what you're trying to describe. Efficacy. 
How well, do, how well does the control you're putting in place perform against others? Or even compensating controls, potentially. And then trend. How are things happen, you know, how are, how are things marking over time? It was this way today, it's this way tomorrow, this way the next day. Can you use those snapshots in time to really tell a story? I'm going to walk through each one of these, give you, give you a little bit of an example. So, efficiency. How well does it perform? I have a target of Y and I have X deployed. So, Jim, I learned fractions in like third, fourth grade, man. You came in here to teach me, uh, teach me fractions, numerators and denominators? No, I came here to tell you it's simple. Size doesn't really matter here. You know, here's my Snowco example, 1,000 over 2,000, 50% deployed. I, my, I've, I've deployed it 50% in the organization, but the point here is make sure you can go to bank with this. You know, make sure you can take this to your CIO, CSO, CISO, CEO, whoever it is. Make sure you find out that that information is valid. Make sure it's um, trusted but verified, right? The mantra of an information security professional. So make sure you actually sit there and verify this number so you can take it to the bank. Put controls in place to make sure that um, if anything that water falls into that number is affected, your number should reflect that as well. Now effectiveness, how well does your control perform? And this is really the heart of it, this is value. How much value is the control that you're putting in place providing? And the way I look at value is really three, three lenses, maybe, maybe there's a fourth in there, but it's really differentiation. How, how is this differentiated from anything else that you're doing? Can it tell a story? Can it answer a question? Right? And these, these vary by control type. And a lot of times, um, you know, at the four-letter security work uh, call out here is there is consensus metrics out there, but you're going to get this from the vendors themselves. I mean, in reality, when you buy something, they're going to sell you on number, you know, what the value proposition is, what number, what dial to take a look at um, to do that. And you can lean on the community as well. There's people out there that will provide uh, a, a lot of those effect, effect, efficient, uh, effectiveness metrics out there. So here's the ones I picked out. It just, you know, there's, there's buckets and buckets of these things. But I said, all right, let's take a look at incidents per endpoint. What's the velocity or how often is the service being utilized and utilization metric? What's my mean time to remediate? How fast when I find something am I actually taking care of it? And then percent automated re remediation. I invested all this time and money in something, but 70% of the time the team's going and having to remediate the viruses themselves? Well, that doesn't sound like I'm getting a lot of value, right? It could be a good indicator. All right, efficacy. This is probably the, the more difficult or most difficult to capture when you're talking about a metrics program. This is how well does it perform versus alternates? Us versus them. You know, that them could be, you know, it could be competitors, it could be industry metrics, it could be another vendor. I don't know. There's not a lot of clearinghouse information on this, but the example I'm going to use here is just around like maybe you have a managed service and you want to take a look at your, um, oops, I have a definition here. There you go, simple, simple math again. Size doesn't matter. X is Y is divide times by 100 and you're going to get yourself something. And I'll tell you how much you're better or worse than somebody else. So in this case, I'm using that service example. I have a service provider that's providing remediation for my endpoints when they find a virus and today we're doing it 30, the vendor we have does it 30 minutes to remediate. The mean time to remediate, that's great. New, new service provider says we could do it in 40 minutes. Well, we're doing a 25% better. All right, we'll stay put for right now. But it's a good metric. You know, I thought about a little bit about this. I mean, there could be ways you could even, you know, say you want to compare your endpoints. Say you have endpoint A, uh, endpoint technology A, and endpoint technology B. Honeypot yourself. Half the order gets, the, you know, if everything's going on a per user per month basis from a service perspective, do half of them with one, half of them the other. It doesn't cost you anything different. You could just sit there and honeypot yourself and say, all right, well, this is a little bit better. Let's, let's, let's put all our coins in this basket. So it becomes interesting when you start taking these metrics because you make better decisions. And then trends. Metrics over time. X of zero, X one, I've captured it today, I've captured it tomorrow, I've done this, I pour it quarterly. It's changing over time. It was this yesterday, now it's this. What's the difference? It's changing over time, percent. Was it a large rate? Should I be scared? Well, logs went up a thousand percent. Well, should be, that should scare people, unless it's one and two logs that you've gotten, right? So some of the, it provides a lot of more context in terms of the information you're looking at. So now I'm going to bring it all together. This is, uh, 
I'm going to build a dashboard based on some of these metrics I pulled together. Um, the first step of building a dashboard is really what story do you want to tell? What's the narrative, the lens you're looking through? If you're a scientist, maybe this is the hypothesis you have, right? You're going to have the scientific method. Here's the question I want to debunk. So what story do you want to end up telling? I'm going to be pitching out to my CISO, and I want to tell him, uh, I want to tell him how the highest covered risk population, how much uh, coverage I have there. I want to talk about overall coverage, because everyone's going to ask that question. And then I want to find out uh, what the impact is to the remediation time. So how long does it take to actually remediate endpoints when you get in these situations? So for endpoint coverage, I took the current coverage, what it is today, what it's been over three months, and I've uh, taken a look at the change since I've started. So here at Snoco, I've taken this job. Now I'm telling a story about how well I performed since you've hired me. Same thing for the me uh, mean time to remediate. Here's my current time, my trend, and how much has changed since I start. And size doesn't matter, just simple metrics here. So now I'm gonna, this is the part where I'm going to actually pitch you like you're my CISO. So this is my dashboard I'm pitching out. Let my best foot forward. Well, Mr. CISO, um, since you've hired me, 100% of my finance users have endpoint protection. We've identified those as the highest risk population and nothing to worry about. We've identified, we've validated that information. We made sure that endpoint is up to date, running. If it goes out of bounds it co and reinstalls, we are covered. No problem. Now in the process, because we have such a low population, 92% of the endpoints have been protected and over three months we've increased by 98.8%. 988 extra endpoints we've done. We've done a, I feel we've done an excellent job. And while we were doing that, we had a 30 time mean time to remediate and well, three months ago it was 20 minutes. So we've actually decreased our ability to remediate viruses. Um, but I can tell you the story is I've dedicated all our resources to make sure those endpoints were protected. So when viruses did happen, we just couldn't respond to them as fast. Seems like a pretty straightforward story. Makes sense to you guys? So when to start? Now. This is the old ancient Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, second best time, today. Just start today. If you're really mature in your program, you know, take a look at it again. You know, if you're at the plan stage, you know, get your inventory, your assets. If you're at the priority stage, just, you know, do it. And if you, uh, if you need to execute, you know, if you've got one domain, maybe it's endpoint protection, maybe you want to take a look at, I think a lot of people have their vulnerability programs. Take a look at that next. Talk about what a vulnerability means. What it means to have a, a host in a DMZ that exposed the risk. You know, start today and, and rinse, repeat. So, wrap it up. You are here. Make sure you do a reality check. Identify where you are in that space time. Put some context around what you're doing. Make sure you understand where you are. Own up to it. Baseline yourself. Size doesn't matter. Value does. Context does. You don't need the next whiz bang, sim, next gen data protection, threat analytics platform in the cloud that's going to solve your organization. Just answer a couple questions. I'm in the, you know, is my security program effective? What have I done with the money? Answer that question. And make sure you tell your story. No one's going to tell it for you. I know that. No one is going to tell your story. So make sure you tell a story. When someone asks you how well you're doing, eh, good. No, I increased things by 98.8% since I've been here. I'm rocking it. That's my story. But also own up when, when things aren't going so well. And has anybody noticed that I, on my four letter security words, none of them are four letters? Because size doesn't matter? Huh? All right. With that, I'll open up to any questions, comments, concerns. Do you guys have any metrics programs in your organizations that are working, not working? Metrics that are tough to communicate, tough to solve? Any stories you haven't told or ones, ones you have told and no one's been happy with them? All right. Well, if you do have questions, hit me up on uh, Twitter. Uh, you can talk to me after this, but thanks. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, question? That's a, that's a good question. I think um, uh, the question, if you didn't hear it, is uh, how do you, when, when you're creating a program, how do you actually go and figure out what the right thing is to go after? I think by doing the inventory. So I, I normally would start with the application and finding out where the data lies. So that, that plan step becomes key because everything else um, pivots off it. So we'll use vulnerability, um, vulnerabilities as a, 
as an example. In my career, I remember the one time I, created, I had that big program, that big report that says, you have eight million vulnerabilities and none of them in passion forever. And everyone just looked at me like, so when I took it back a little bit, I said, okay, well, what matters? Let me inventory, let me take a look at the applications and the infrastructure it sits on. So I was able to say, okay, let's do it this way. How many applications have information sit in DMZ? Highest risk. How many of them have financial information? How many of them have PII on them? So I started carving up those attributes on it. So when I, when I came back to them, it wasn't about what they wanted to hear. When I said, hey, you give me this report, it means nothing to me. What do I do? I said, all right, well, I'll tell you what. You know that PCI compliance we're trying to get? Well, these systems over here are unpatched. I don't, I don't even deal in vulnerabilities. I deal in hosts. I don't, don't in, uh, de you know, in the infrastructure. You, know, you have 40,000 vulnerabilities, but it's four servers. You have four servers that deal with your credit card information that are at risk. And that's how I would explain it to them. So I, I think that lens of that plan and identifying what attributes make sense. So if you're in sales, it's, you know, if you're dealing with credit card, uh, PCI, if you're in medical, you know, you're dealing with HIPAA. So it's, uh, EPHI. So I think it's really about taking that your lens. And then you have a vernacular to speak to people about. But you're right. They won't know. <laughs> they will not know what to, to say. They, they will give you zero advice. So you have to kind of create that, 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 uh, lexicon of vernacular to talk to them about it. Yeah, and when you do that plan stuff, too, it becomes like a network, an information network, not a real network, but an information network. You know who it is, what they have access to, what systems they use, you know, when they last use it, right? All of a sudden, it's just like, it comes a heat map and it comes, you know, pointing right at you. I'm scared of this one. And that's the one you could actually go after. That use case, anyway. You had a question? Yeah, I've been involved in it. I don't know if I've been as successful as I think I'd like to be in my mind, but um, but yeah, I, I think gaining the trust to begin with. So once you say you're going to do something, that that just the first metric, the um, uh, the eff uh, efficiency, that's the first one to go after. You, I gave you money. What'd you do with it? Because a lot of times, you know, you buy a project, at the end, you know, you spend money at the end of the year. Now you're next year you have to go implement it, and they, they, I've been had people breathe down my neck before going, well, I gave you the money to do it. What'd you do with it? I think just staying on that and building the trust to say, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. In terms of translating that and getting more money, uh, that's a little trickier. I know, and I've been looking at this myself. The National Association of Directors, as NACD. I don't know if anybody familiar with these resources, but if you get the information from the NACD. They should have a list of metrics um, that the board cares about, and I, I haven't. I think you have to pay. That's probably why I haven't got access to it yet. <laughs> but if you get access to that information, you could actually take that and say, "Okay, this is this is that pivot I need in order to talk the way the board talks." So it's probably trust between you and your CISO. If it's you and your board or your CEO, it's probably more like um, more the the business language to to really or, and risk and risk. If you have a mature risk program, talk about and in plain language. Hey, Susie loses her laptop. Our reputation is is over. Any question? That's a good point. Maybe never, never go out without an ask at the end. Hey, I've done X, Y, and Z, but you know what I could use? I could use one more person. I could use one more, you know, I could use this over here, consultant for a little bit, help me out. Any other questions? Any other comments, experience you guys have? Cool. I appreciate you spending your last, uh, your last time with me. Thanks.